Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the believers of Boyo. Last time we left off after a very eventful episode that saw the colonists of Red Chapel defend themselves from an infestation and from a tribal raid, a raid that was luckily quickly taken care of by a horde of manhunting panthers. Barely alive, we also captured one of the raiders, Kevin's sister, and we also advanced Brandon to the rank of knight and can now finally trade with the Empire. Now to get us started today, I'm following up on two naming suggestions from the comments of the last episode, as Elephant Calf Azazi is now renamed to Admiral Azazi, and the recently tamed Ilion, or Ilion, receives the title of Marquis, some of you did point out that the name is most likely of French origin, so this fits nicely I think. In the early morning hours we can then watch as Maniac is being chased by a rhino that did not appreciate his hunting attempt, but melee fighters Kyle and Wyatt are quick on the scene to take care of the problem. In our mountain base meanwhile we start digging, this here will be our new and improved workshop, as the other one is getting a bit too small for all the production facilities we will eventually need. As you can see, the area is quickly mined out and we even grab some steel along the way, so we can now begin smoothing everything. While we do, let's also talk about Kevin's sister, who we will in fact recruit and not put through our prisoner repentance program, as many of you have pointed out she did not actually harm us or our colony in the slightest, she may have even tried to defect over to us, who knows, at least she was quick to convert to our ideology and should therefore not receive any further punishment. Now, should she decide to start a prison break and potentially harm anyone, things might take a different turn, but for now we will have Kevin attempt to convince her to stay. Our new workshop meanwhile is rapidly coming along, at the moment we really have a decent number of both miners and constructors, and so in the evening we've got things mostly set up as they were in the old one. On the following morning, while the old workshop is being connected with our storage room, we are then also constructing two new workstations, an electric smelter and an electric smithy. The latter will actually be very important in a few moments, as we are trying to get the most out of Brandon's creativity inspiration. And that is also why after unlocking transport parts, and with that a hopefully substantial increase to our trading activities, we are now quickly going to research long blades, in particular because of the long sword that this unlocks. With three researchers once again able to work simultaneously, this should not take long, and Squeaks already gives us a taste of what might be to come with a masterwork armchair construction, hopefully Brandon can follow suit. While putting up shelves in our expanded storage room, a few more masterworks are being created, seems like being pregnant is giving Squeaks some new vigor, and every bit helps to make even our storage room an impressive place to be in. In the early evening we can also briefly check on our youngest, Ellie, and we can see she has reached the highest possible growth tier, so once she ages up we can choose three passions and one trait from the maximum number of six options each. And that's good timing, because her birthday is coming up very soon, at the age of seven to be exact, and considering her increased aging rate, that's actually tomorrow. So while we use the night to give Dimitri work orders to construct two transport pod launchers, Ellie celebrates her seventh birthday in the jungle, and as such now unlocks plenty of new work types that she can perform. Much more interesting than that, however, are the choices for passions and traits. For passions we have crafting, cooking, construction, plants, shooting and intellectual, and for traits we have the very useful industrious, the situationally useful careful shooter, great memory for reduced skill loss rate, Delicate, which I think is to be avoided, and Gourmand, a trait that Ellie's father took also has. We can also elect not to pick a trait, but there are too many useful ones here to do that, so after a bit of thinking, here's what we're doing. For passions, we are going with cooking, shooting, and intellectual. Cooking, to follow in Father Took's footsteps, and also because the colony really only has him as the main chef. Shooting, because we are seeing our fair share of combat and Ellie already has a shooting skill of 4 from lessons taught by others. And intellectual, because I feel like she spends a lot of time in our research slash hospital room, and with Kevin being our moral guide, I assume she has picked up on a thing or two. For traits then, the overall best choice probably would have been industrious, but I actually like the idea of having Ellie coming after her father, so I went with Gourmand to immediately give her a nice boost to the cooking skill, that she is now also passionate for. 
And so, this is what her skills now look like at the age of 7, and from here she once again needs to advance through the growth tiers, so that we can ideally have the same freedom of choice the next time she ages up. While the transport pods are then being constructed, a heat wave strikes the tropical rainforest, although it should remain nice and cool underneath the mountain, so I don't think we are in too much trouble here. Since we are also running out of components to make more drop pods, we are mining for some. We could also research towards fabrication to make our own, but that will take quite some time to unlock. In the meantime, this here will have to do, and so we can now load up our pair of pods with Brandon, our trader, and with Light to fast skip the two back home. In terms of trade goods, we are packing as much as the pods can carry. Chocolate, insect jelly and camp fuel we have plenty of, some furs and leathers, a few spare drugs, and plenty of elephant tusks and thrombohorns. It takes a few hours to load all of that into the pods, the Imperial Tribute Collector also passes by in the meantime, but we're not selling them Kevin's sister. And so, while Took goes on another one of his food binges, we are ready to launch our first transport pods. And obviously, the nearby Empire Settlement is our destination of choice. Let's see what they have for us. Okay, so this is what trading with the Empire looks like. We brought lots of stuff and still it's not enough. First of all, we are grabbing some plasteel, we need that for the longsword later. Then we're buying the side trainer for invisibility to give to Brandon and a shooting skill trainer for Ellie to set her off on the right path. We are also grabbing some Eltex gear, we do have two full-time sidecasters after all. And now the question is, what else to buy? You can see here that a gene pack is for sale, including the deathless and size sensitive gene, so that could be interesting. However, without going into too much detail, the complexity here is plus 8. At the moment we can only use gene packs up to plus 5. Not to mention that using this gene pack also requires a so-called archite capsule, which is in fact for sale too, but together the two would run at about 4300 silver, and we simply cannot afford that. Another intriguing item that we cannot afford is this Persona Monosword here for just 7000 silver. It comes with the Neural Cooling and Kind Thoughts traits, so it might be useful in the hands of a Psycaster. Let me know if you want us to save up to grab it, otherwise I think we'll spend our money elsewhere. For the moment, our remaining funds simply go towards two excellent quality marine helmets. Head protection is absolutely vital at this stage, and at this quality level they are actually significantly surpassing cataphract helmets. And again, there are a few other items here that might be of interest too, but that's the beauty of now having access to trade with the Empire. Where before most caravans only had a handful of things that were of interest, these guys now have so much that we struggle to find ways to purchase it all. On that note, if you have ideas for how our colonists might pump out some trade goods that fit our ideology and can perhaps even be manufactured underneath the mountain, then let me know. My first thought was to simply make lots of stone statues, that would definitely fit nicely with the tunneler meme, but they take a while, and perhaps you have some more creative ideas, so let me know in the comments down below. Either way, after fast skipping back home our trade trip is complete, Brandon can now learn the invisibility sidecast while Ellie uses the skill trainer to improve her shooting skill to level 10, and then begins butchering an elephant, as her new duties now include occasional work in the kitchen. A short while later, long blades are unlocked and we can therefore get to smithing soon, while our research efforts are now put towards proper medicine. I think that's something the believers of Boyo would like to have access to. In his fresh new Altex robe, Brandon then goes to work on the smithy and begins making a plasteel longsword. I am hoping for his inspiration to give us at least masterwork quality, which would actually put the damage on par with a Persona monosword, Another reason why I did not attempt to purchase the one we just looked at. The rest of the afternoon then remains uneventful until Maniac once again aggros a group of elephants in the early evening. Thankfully, it's just two of them, so our combined firepower is enough to take them out. Ellie then also equips her first weapon. I really like the idea of giving her a minigun, but the thing is just too heavy for her, so the LMG will have to do for now. Down the line we will most likely switch to something even lighter, like an SMG for example. The following day then has us mining some more steel. If we want to continue using drop pods, a steady supply is a good idea, and it seems like we have found a sizable vein over here. 
In the afternoon, the heat wave then thankfully comes to an end and we also receive another relic quest. It is unfortunately another old complex that wants to be explored. We already did that once and also still have a second quest like this waiting for us, so this would be number three. Let's hope that the next and final one is something different. Brandon then finishes the longsword, using up his creativity, inspiration and producing a legendary work, somewhat unexpected with a crafting skill of only 11, but we now have a melee weapon with a DPS of almost 20, which actually surpasses that Persona Monosword we looked at earlier. With the name of Red Toad, it also fits nicely together with the Plasma Sword Red Hawk, which for comparison sits at a melee DPS of 18.3, although it does give Wyatt the very useful Psychic Sensitizer trait. Still, switching him over to that Monosword from the Empire might still be on the table, even if it's just to remove the Kill Sorrow trait, as the Longsword now goes to Kyle, our second melee specialist. In the evening then, we accept both of those relic quests, the old complex and the ancient installation. As you can see, the quest locations are not too far away from our home, although we will most likely not make the trip through mountainous jungle anyway, and instead rely on drop pods and fast skip. In the middle of the night, we also have our very first of the dreaded electrical explosions, this one striking our workshop and hospital, but thankfully our colonists are quick on the scene to put out the fires, and while everyone else goes back to bed, Night Owl Dimitri can begin the repairs. After a few hours of morning meditation, Light's fast skip is then ready to go again, and so we load up the first pair of transport pods, this one with Took, Vampire Volek, Light and Maniac, and no further supplies, and we'll send them out towards that first ancient complex. As they arrive, the ruins we need to explore are easily spotted, but before we go in, let's build another pair of pods, which we can then load up with Brandon, Kyle, Wyatt and Dimitri, who then join the first half of the party at the mission site. As usual then, we dig our way in and for the time being, we do not detect anything too dangerous, a few chests, the first terminal, but no enemies. Kyle does eventually stumble upon a group of insects, but this one is small enough to not give us any trouble, I think. The rest of the ruins, meanwhile, seems to be clear. And because the path into the northern part is blocked by the bugs and we need to take them out anyway, we might as well do so on our terms. So let's assemble the team and open things up with a berserk pulse from light. This gets the insects fighting among each other while we pick off the pieces and, well, I don't think I need to show you the entirety of this. As expected, the fight is over quickly and only Wyatt takes an injury, a single bruise that should hopefully heal soon. Continuing to explore then, we find the remainder of the ruins empty, except for the very last room, which houses a group of sleeping mechanoids. For now though, they are asleep and this might be a slightly more difficult fight, so let's first take care of what we came here for and hack those four terminals. We'll see what that triggers and can then decide whether or not it's worth taking on the mechs. One after another, the hacks are then completed and number four does in fact trigger something. Not the mechanoids, but a raid by a small party of Neanderthals. While they make their way over to us, we also open up all the crates, which thankfully does not spawn anything else, and hacking the ancient comms console also drops in a pod of Hyperweave. The mechs, meanwhile, are still sleeping, while that comms console has also caused a group of Itakin to attack, although just three of them, I think we can handle that. And the same is also true for the entirely melee-based Neanderthals. Gunfire kills a few of them, Berserk Pulse slows them down, and Carl and Wyatt hack and slash their way through the rest. The three Itakin also get mixed up in the fight, but after a few short moments, everyone is either dead or fleeing, and we haven't taken so much as a single injury. And with that, I think we can now grab all the valuables and leave this place. I really see no reason to engage the mechs at this point, so let's just make our way off to the edge of the map and then get out of here. Now, my original plan was to travel straight to the next ancient complex, but as you can see it's getting dark and the journey over there would take us close to two days, so let's just fast skip back home. I think we should get there quicker if we just take drop pods instead. During the night then, we can also see that Sanguophage Vulek should think about taking his death rest soon and, well, we do want him to finish that before light has to go, so let's take care of it right now. 
The death rest casket is already in place, an accelerator is also already connected, so it will now only take him three days, during which he will be entirely unresponsive. In emergencies such as an infestation, we could of course wake him up, but the penalties for doing so are severe, so let's hope that no such situation arises. As the following day then rolls around, we dig out another section of a mountain over by the river, because our need for power has increased somewhat now that we have someone actively death resting, not to mention that we have also constructed a few extra workstations. As you can see, a fitting spot for a third watermill generator is quickly found, at least that's what I thought. We'll get back to this in just a moment, for now let me also quickly mention that death resting freezes the pawn's certainty in their ideology, so we are not losing any of the progress we have made towards converting Volek to the ways of Boyo, he does prove to be an awfully resistant colonist though. Now regarding the water mill, you can see the problem here on the next morning, the wheels of the two generators on the left are obstructing each other, thus causing both to drop to a power output of only 330 watts, while the unobstructed one on the right produces a constant 1100. I simply overlooked that, but it's easily fixed, we can quickly carve out a bit more rock further to the left and then move the water mill over there. And yes, I am using the Minify Everything mod for this, I think in a situation like this it's alright to do so. The rest of the day remains uneventful, Wyatt spends his evening making a few thrombofer dusters, there is no need to have the material just sitting around in our storage room and dusters make for pretty good protection, perhaps even more so if we research flak vests next to wear underneath. At night then another elephant is born and as always that means we pick a name from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above, this time we are going with Lizette's, and as always, I am eagerly awaiting your ideas for the royal title that this new elephant could receive. As the sun then rises again, a trade ship is passing by, and so Kevin can use our comms console for the very first time. Once again, we are selling chocolate and insect jelly, and also once again, there are some gene packs for sale, although except for Happy, there is nothing here that we really need, and even Happy could go against the whole idea of the guilty meme, after all, we do not want to live in eternal bliss, we simply want to help others be happy. Either way, we are skipping it, and instead grab ourselves a death rest capacity serum, very important if we want to connect more than just one machine to a pawn's death rest casket, and since the potential bonuses for doing so can be huge, we definitely want to buy these wherever we can find them. For now, I have not yet decided who gets it, but let me know which one of our two sangophages you would like to see elevated, Volek or Light. In the meantime, we are ready to tackle the next ruins, so with the first batch of pods, let's send out Light, Maniac, Wyatt and Brandon. The four of them arrive right in front of the ruin, and this time we explore a bit before deciding whether or not we need to send in reinforcements. If we don't have to, I would prefer to save the steel and components for the two additional drop pods. However, it does look like this ancient complex is infested by insects too, while we also have two rooms with unstable fuel nodes. After looping around those, we then thankfully do not detect any further threats, such as mechanoids, but still, let's send over Took, Dimitri and Kyle just to be on the safe side. The plan against the bugs is then pretty much the exact same as before, open the door, cast berserk poles and see how things go from there. The only problem this time around is that the room the insects are in has more than one door, and unfortunately quite a few of our enemies used that to escape the carnage and are now roaming freely around the ruin and its surroundings. Still, the bulk of the attackers is swiftly defeated, and once again only Wyatt takes a few scratches and bruises. And while it takes us a few more moments, eventually the last of the insects is defeated, and so we set out to hack another set of terminals. This time, however, doing so immediately spawns the next threat, and yes, it's another round of insects, this time coming from below. Luckily, as they emerge, we can also see that it's a very small group, so we quickly slice our way through most of them. Once again, the layout of the ruins forces us to hunt some of them down, but soon after we once again receive the good news that the area is hostile free. So let's try this again and this time hacking the four terminals is not interrupted, Brandon here is only attacked after finishing his task, but thankfully we gave him the invisibility sidecast earlier, so he should be able to escape. In the meantime, finishing the hack has once again triggered a raid, this time by a group of tox-resistant wasters, but it will take them some time to reach us, so let's open some crates while they approach. Doing so then also triggers a group of ancients to wake up from what I suppose are ancient crypto sleep caskets, I may have somewhat overlooked those earlier, 
But regardless, not only will they now first take out that last mega spider for us, they are then also getting themselves caught up in a fierce battle with the wasters. Our colonists meanwhile have retreated and are simply waiting this one out, eventually a handful of brave survivors are coming for us, but none of them survive being skipped between Wyatt and Kyle. And so, all threats on the map have been defeated once more, we can now loot the remaining crates, detonate those fuel nodes, hack the supply satellite and open the big red treasure chest, which would have triggered the insects if they weren't dead already. And so, we can now escape the burning remains of this ancient complex, don't worry, the loot from the chest was a bionic stomach that we are taking with us through the reform caravan screen here, a couple of weapons, supplies and utility items are also coming back home with us, all in all it's a pretty good haul. One far skip later, our explorers then all return inside of Kevin's bedroom and move out to stow away their treasures, and just as a quick look at how we're doing, Colony Wealth is currently sitting at 175,000 and we need 275 to finish the second chapter of the Arconexus questline, so we still have a way to go. As Kevin then once again attempts to recruit his sister and gets her resistance down to just 2.5, we can also wake up Sanguophage Volek again, he has completed his death rest and even though we could let him sleep for a little while longer, let's wake him and send light in next. He is due for his beauty sleep too and with two missions just completed, I think we are done for the moment. And with that, I also think that we can now make the cut in today's episode. So let's wrap things up at this point and let's marvel at some more fan art. And this week we have so many submissions that I cannot possibly describe them all in detail. To get us started we have a grand total of 5 pieces by Isaac Young, including one about Kevin and his sister. For that, Isaac once again submitted a lengthy description that you can find in the comments down below. We also have 2 pieces of AI generated art about that whole panther business last episode. YTHP also returns with 3 more submissions this week, 2 depicting Light casting his famous berserk poles and a third featuring Ellie who has made a drawing. And finally we also have a submission by longtime contributor Tony Murchison, you may have seen this one in the RimWorld subreddit already, as it depicts an alternate future for Ellie, a future where she becomes a Sangophage too. And while we take in all of that lovely creativity, I would like to ask you one question as we wrap things up here. What do you think about the whole animal situation we currently have going on? I feel like with our herd of elephants growing steadily, the need for our other animals, most notably the donkeys and the bears, is reducing. And I would like to know whether or not you guys feel the same way. If you do, then I will try to get rid of the donkeys and bears at some point in the near future, so that we can then go elephants only for the rest of the way. But let me know what you think about this, this was just something going through my mind while I was editing the episode, and before I make a decision I would like to hear your thoughts on the matter. And with that we have now officially reached the end, so thank you all once again so much for the lovely artwork. You can find my email address on screen if you want to submit yours, and as always I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.